If God wanted to find a way to come to earth that would make God's presence unmistakable so that everybody would know, oh, that's God for sure, how should God do it? Sometimes it takes engaging our imagination to do this, and I've been spending a little bit of time this week doing that. Here's some of what I came up with. What if one day God could form a huge slit right through the sky? And out of the slit would come down two giant God hands that would pull the slit open, kind of like bed covers. And then through the slit, what if a huge, whirling, golden tornado came down? And then the tornado came and touched on the earth. And as it touched the surface of the earth, it bounced just a little bit. And in the bounce, out of the top of the funnel, came about a a million baby tornadoes that then all went whirling in their golden light all over the earth. That would be one way. Then I was thinking, what if instead there were a huge volcano that could come up out of the ocean and it would start off as a giant mountain just growing, growing, growing out of the ocean and it would get so tall that you could just stand on Main Street in Ravina and see it. You wouldn't need to be near the coast. you just look over the horizon wherever you were and there would be the mountain. And it would be gushing lava, iridescent, rainbow-colored lava. That's another way. Should I keep going? All right, I'll, I'll, I'll stop. But you hear what I'm saying. There's a million ways your imagination could keep going endlessly about this. But God already came to earth. And God did not choose to come as a tornado or as a volcano. God came as a baby, a human baby, one of us. Most of the geese now have gone by this time of year, but there are some left. And if you want to see geese, you have to go this time of year to bodies of water. I've always noticed that and never understood why. So I did a little research, and it turns out that in the wintertime, geese like to be in the water because they've got down, so they can handle temperatures that other animals can't. And whenever they're in the middle of a body of water, they're safe from their predators. A coyote or a fox can't get to a goose if they're in the middle of a pond. So that's exactly what they do. But there's a danger to that because they go for long winter naps on those ponds. And it can happen that the temperature drops 30 or 40 degrees overnight. And if the goose is sleeping, they won't perceive that ice is forming all around them. And then when they go to take off in the morning, what happens is their wings flap against the hardened surface of the ice and they can't get any lift. If you go on YouTube, you'll find lots of clips of people rescuing geese who've gotten frozen in lakes. It's actually a thing. So that brings me to a true story about a couple that lived on land in the country. Picture Queeman's Hollow or Hannah Croy or somewhere like that. And that had a pond in their backyard. And one day, this time of year, a whole flock of geese came and landed on that pond. And the husband and wife talked about how dangerous that was because they knew something the geese didn't. And that was that a cold front was coming that night. And it was going to drop the temperature from the 30s to the sub-zeros, and the pond was gonna freeze. So they wanted to get rid of the geese, so the husband tried first. He went out and he ran like a maniac toward the pond and he screamed and he waved his hands, and the geese didn't like that, and so they took off. But as soon as he went in the house, they just settled right back down. So then the wife went out with pots and pans and shrieking, and they didn't like that either. But the same thing happened all over again as soon as she went in. And they were talking about what they could do. And he said, I I wish we had a shotgun or something. I I would fire a warning shot in the air. But they didn't have one, and they didn't know what to do next. And he said to his wife, I can't stand knowing that they're going to get hurt if they don't leave. I wish there were a way that I could get this message across to them in a way they could understand. I wish I could speak their language. I wish that for just a few moments I could become one of them so that I could warn them and keep them safe. And as he looked at his wife, tears were streaming down her face. And she said, 
you sound like God. You sound like God. And they never looked at Jesus the same way again. Christmas morning is a good opportunity for us to take stock of some of the stuff that we have thought about God or projected onto God that is just not true. A lot of us do it. A lot of us have an image of God as being picky, a God who only likes perfectionists, who doesn't have patience for people's problems, who's exhausted and disappointed by how we act. Or we think of God having a great big list of all the things we've ever done wrong, and God has it rehearsed, and God has it memorized, and knows exactly everything we've ever done, and is really fed up. Even when we're on good terms with God, so often we talk about God in distant terms. We say things like, oh, the man upstairs. And even when it's a good thing, we'll say, when something good happens, the man upstairs must like me today, as if God is a middle school vice principal or something. But none of that stuff is who God is, and we have to own that. That was all stuff that we projected onto God. We know for sure that that's not how God is. And how do we know? Because God already chose to come and be with us. Jesus perfectly reveals God. Jesus is God. So if we want to understand God, we have to look at Jesus. And how did Jesus act? Well, we know he was humble. So humble. From his very birth, he started off that way. And he was loving. And he was generous. And he was forgiving and merciful. Do you remember the time that the woman was caught in the very act of adultery and she was brought into the circle of this angry mob and they were going to stone her to death? And what did he say to her? He said, you may have done what they said you did, but you are not who they say you are. You've learned a lesson from this. Now go. No strings attached. Go. Live in a new way. And that's what God says to us. You may have done what they say you did, but that doesn't mean that you're who they say you are. Jesus always was hanging out with people with problems and issues, always with sinners. And what would he say to them? Notorious sinners. He would say, you are more than the sum of your faults. You are more than your defects and your wounds and your sins all rolled up. That doesn't sum up who you are. You're worth more than that. And I see your potential. And I want to invest in you. And that's exactly what he says to us, too. So here's where it gets interesting. We are called to then imitate the way he was. To not just admire him for being so good, but to imitate him. And the way we do that is not that complicated. Sometimes we make it more than it is. It's in every moment, in every decision that we have to make, it's choosing the next right thing to do. In this opportunity, at this day, what's the next right thing that I can do? That's why people always had those bracelets that said WWJD on them. What would Jesus do? And we might say, I don't know what Jesus would do, but we do know. We've been his followers all along. We know what he would do. Sometimes people will say to me, but not every choice is easy. There's goods and bads and everything. And sometimes I'm choosing between two options that might work. How do I know what to do then? Well, if you want to do what Jesus would do, you look at the two options and you pick the one that is the most kind, the most generous, the most forgiving and merciful, the most loving. Whatever is the most beautiful of the choices that's the one Jesus would choose. The most surprisingly generous and good. The most beautiful. The man who made his wife cry because he sounded like God was never the same again. He said that he realized that if he could think and talk and act like God that one day of his life, then he could do it more. He could do it every day. He had the opportunity, the the potential to think and talk and act like God. And there's people who do that, and you know them. There's a woman in this parish 
who whenever I get done talking with her, I feel like whatever she said to me is exactly what God would have said. I so often say, I think that's exactly what God would say if God were speaking to me. She wrote me a Christmas card, and she started it off saying, I'm not that good at expressing myself. But by the time I was done reading the card, I thought, if God sent me a Christmas card, I feel like this is what it would say. Wouldn't it be great if people were talking behind all of our backs like that and saying, she's so much like Jesus. He reminds me so much of God. This person is so generous, so kind. Wouldn't it be wonderful if that was what was said about us? So on this Christmas morning, this white Christmas that we all wished for, let us go forward from here knowing that we are called to imitate Jesus because this world is so in need of hope. And we can give that if we would only make the choice, moment by moment, to act like God.